Mr. Chair, council members and participants, we are now live. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a public hearing of the Special Committee on Criminal Justice Reform regarding resolution number 200565. And before we get started, I'd like to recognize Ms. Samantha Williams Esquire, who will read a required announcement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently re meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, Legal Intelligencer, all prior to the hearing, and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because this hearing is being recorded, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in this meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to Councilman Jones recognizing members for questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, and at this time, will you please call the roll to uh, determine which committee members are in attendance? I would ask that the committee members say a few words so that you, your image will appear on uh, television so that we can capture that uh, for the record. Ms. Williams. Councilmember Johnson. Here. Present. Thank you, Councilmember. Co-Chair Keir Bradford Gray. I'm here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. District Attorney Larry Krasner. I'm here and thank you for inviting me as well. Thank you. Is Judge DeLeon with us today? John Holloway? Uh, I'm here, thank you very much. We are also joined by Simeon Pohl, who is standing in for Claire Schubick Richards on behalf of the Prison Society. Welcome. Hi there, I am here. And I'm uh, pleased to be here. Chairman Jones. I am present and uh, we have established a quorum. Uh, this hearing is now called to order. Um, Ms. Williams, will you please read the title of the resolution that we are considering today? Resolution number 200565 authorizing the City Council Special Committee on Criminal Justice Reform to hold public hearings that will serve as a listening session for the public to weigh in on what a new Citizens Police Oversight Commission would look like if approved on the November 3rd, 2020 general election. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And before we get started, um, I just want to say that this um, historic uh, ballot question will create a blank canvas that we as a city will be able to paint um, rules and regulations that uh, will allow for questions of conduct of police to be considered. Um, since 1993, I believe, there has been some form of police advisory Committee. I think it was started under the Rendell administration. Um, it has had a roller coaster of ups and downs, um, sometimes underfunded uh, and underappreciated, uh, if you would. Uh, what we hope to do is establish consistency. We hope to establish uh, a dedicated funding stream uh, and some independence from political wills and executive orders so that there is a predictability as to where citizens can register a complaint, where citizens can have that complaint heard 
and where the public uh, can, in a transparent manner, uh, view those complaints to their conclusion. Um, in addition, I'd like to offer my co-chairs an opportunity to say a few words as well. Uh, we'll start with uh, Defender Gray. Thank you so much, Councilman Jones. And I too echo your sentiments of why this is uh, really a major advancement for the city of Philadelphia. I do want to remind us that the city of Philadelphia, I believe, was the first to implement a police advisory commission. And since then, major cities around the country have perfected it more so that it is operationally able to produce the type of results that we want, which is shedding a light on things that we don't want in our police departments and giving citizens the uh, feeling that they their voices are heard when they are complaining about incidents that occur between them and law enforcement on the streets. One of the things my office has been instrumental in looking at is how many civilian uh, complaints against police are answered, sustained, and how often civilians can get an idea or an understanding of what's happening when they do take the time and effort and write out a complaint for some kind of reprieve. Um, we have found that the response to citizens have been very low. Uh, whatever the reasons are, this is something that has kind of perpetuated the mistrust between citizens and police departments. It is something that can be fixed and easily fixed and have a huge impact on the way police, uh, on the way citizens view the process by which they are to be protected against officers who abuse their power uh, in their opinions. Doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect, but sunshine is corruption's natural disinfectant. When you allow things to be done without anyone being able to look at it. As Samantha said, we have a sunshine law and that's something that city council has to abide by. Uh, people who are trusted with protecting and serving our community should have the same. And I believe that this police oversight commission, once we figure out what it should look like and should act under a certain guise, will be the answer that this city has been looking for. So thank you very much for sponsoring this or having this uh, hearing. I can't wait to hear from all of the uh, people who will be testifying on behalf of this bill. Thank you, Defender Gray. And I wanna take a moment to also recognize um, Mark Tyler, uh, who has uh, tirelessly uh, spent time listening uh, to the community uh, and doing a lot of the legwork to try to get a balanced approach of what may be useful uh, once this uh, um, November 3rd ballot is considered and God willing passed. Uh, and I wanted to thank him personally and on the record for that type of involvement uh, as a as a citizen uh, in Philadelphia. That makes me proud. Uh, may, I like echo that? may I echo that, Councilman Jones? Yes, you may. You're a co-chair. Our office yeah. has, has worked with power and live free uh, for at least two and a half years on this. And Reverend Tyler and his, you know, massive amount of activist uh, community has never wavered on this issue. And in fact, has educated me on a lot of things. So I thank him tremendously for everything that he and the Live Free uh, Coalition has done. So with that, are, are there any other members of the committee that would like to say a few words before we get started? Going once, going twice, hearing none. Ms. Williams, would you please read the names of the first panel to testify? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I call up the first panel, I just wanted to um, acknowledge that Judge DeLeon is a member of the committee and is now present. Um, oh. And that we are also joined by council members Thomas, Gautier, and Brooks. And we are also joined by Anthony Arachi, who is the new acting executive director of the Police Advisory Commission and policy analyst Angelica Hendricks of the Police Advisory Commission, who are available for any questions that members of the committee might have for them. And we are also joined by the new first deputy managing director, Vanessa Garrett Harley, who is here to listen in to our conversation as well. Welcome to all uh, and thank you for your participation. Um, let's hear from the witnesses, Ms. Williams. 
Uh, I will call up at this time Regina Farrell, Judith, Max Palmer, Carlos, Brendan, and Chip Sinton. Thank you all for uh, agreeing to testify. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Always a good idea to take your uh, mic off mute. Judith, I think you can testify first. Um, I don't see Regina logged in. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Judith Max Palmer. My interest in police accountability led me to an internship at the Police Advisory Commission where I had the opportunity to see our local efforts at oversight up close. The limitations of the PAC were obvious and must not be repeated in the next oversight body. I sat in on audits of investigations performed by Internal Affairs and discovered that Internal Affairs officers who investigate other officers with complaints against them aren't even necessarily trained as detectives. Many investigations were missing essential information. Often the investigating officer had failed to ask very basic questions. What this tells us is that internal affairs does not perform good investigations. The new oversight body must have full access to perform frontline investigations. It must have full and simultaneous real-time direct access to all documents and evidence, including but not limited to PPD personnel files, all PPD databases, internal affairs investigative files, criminal and civil case files, disciplinary hearing records, video and audio recordings from body cameras and other sources, including those from DIVIC, all PPD policies, procedures, practices, the full contract between the city and the FOP, as well as the outcome of every negotiation, and all any other documents that pertain to policies, tactics, complaints, or charges against PPD officers and their subsequent investigation and adjudication, any other sources of information deemed appropriate by the oversight body, everything. Often people demand that a new board have that the, that the new board have subpoena power, and many don't realize that the PAC does in fact have subpoena power, but does not exert it. Why? Because they are housed under the managing director's office, as is the PPD. And while this was never really explained to me in a manner that I could really understand, the best I could make of it was that if the PAC subpoenaed the PPD, the PPD would fight it, and lawyers would get involved, and it would cost a lot of money, and it would be an internal war in the MBO's office. So what this tells us is that in order for the oversight board to be effective, it needs to be a completely autonomous entity. During my time at the PAC, it had a staff of 10. It has shrunk due to COVID-related cutbacks to seven and is now at six with the departure of the executive director. So how are six people supposed to provide oversight to a police department of 7,700? Oversight bodies in other major cities have funding equivalent to one to two percent of the police department they oversee, and we deserve no less. And let me be clear that money must come from the existing police budget. They have over $700 million of taxpayer money. They can spend $7 million on oversight. They spend that much of our money on laundry every year. They got that much from us for overtime during five days of our protests against their brutality this summer. They don't need more money. There's a lot of turnover on the current commission. Commissioners don't get paid. They should get paid. I recommend the current police budget for that funding as well. And really commissioners should be elected like a school board. But however they're selected, they should reflect Philadelphia, especially the black and brown communities that are most affected by police. We've all heard about cases where officers had been fired and gotten their jobs back. Yes, under the current contract between the city and the FOP, officers can grieve employment terminations and have those grievances resolved by an arbitrator. Having said that, I learned about many cases wherein the police commissioner failed to follow proper procedure in firing a bad cop, or the FOP hired aggressive attorneys to support their bad apple members, and the department just failed to make their case. So what this tells us is that it's easier to fire bad cops if you actually invest some effort and expertise into the process. The new oversight board should have final authority over recruitment, training, and hiring, but also firing. If it's adequately funded and staffed, it should be much more effective. I'll close with the biggest surprise of my time at the PAC, and that is what officers themselves told me about their job and coworkers. They told me the issues that drive crime are complex. We can't just arrest our way out of them. They told me, we deal with people at their worst, and if we're not careful, we become that. They told me, it's a toxic culture. It's us against them. We treat people like garbage and then wonder why they hate us. One community member, a black grandmother from North Philly, told me that she used to see stop and frisk as a necessary evil and that it was a cop who explained to her that it's a tactic that does more, far more harm than good. 
All these officers believe that the Philly PD just needs some work. They're not naive or indifferent, but they believe in policing. And what this tells us is that even the best police in the city still think they got this. There's problems, but they're working on them. And what the history of the department and especially their behavior this summer tells us is that they don't. And we need you to do it and do it right. Please provide strong and effective oversight. Thank you for your time. Wow. Thank you for your testimony. Is it the pleasure of the group that we do questioning of each individual or would we prefer to do them in groups of three? I would say groups of three. That groups would be my three. All right. Please stick around so that we can ask you questions. Thank you so much. Who's next, Ms. Williams? Carlos Brendan. Mr. Brendan. Uh, thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, thank you to this committee for allowing me to testify this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to share some of my thoughts on what the Citizens Police Oversight Commission would look like if it comes to pass on November 3rd. It is obvious that the community has had their concerns about police conduct, not only in the city, but across the country. In recent months and years, those concerns has sky have skyrocketed due to the media coverage of high profile deaths at the hands of police officers during arrests or investigations that have escalated into tragedy. Adding the public outrage, outrage, information that slowly trickles out to the public is a mixed bag of facts, lies, speculations, and assumptions. In promoting this hearing, I have noticed the hashtag, who polices the police? I understand the public's distrust of the police department. It is warranted, but under some circumstances, not deserved. The media has focused on terrible actions and decisions made by officers that unfortunately reflect on their fellow officers who put their lives on the line every day they have their uniform on. It is rare that I witness through mainstream or social media uplifting positive stories about our men and women in blue. If the oversight committee is enacted, what I would not want to see is a bandwagon effect in persecuting officers in the realm of public opinion. And in making that statement, I have two suggestions that I would like to see implemented into the committee. My first suggestion is every member of the committee should go through the academy just like a recruit. I don't mean visiting the academy just to observe. I actually mean going through every aspect of the academy, from studying and taking exams to the physical training as well. I feel this will give insight to committee members and how our officers are trained and how decisions are made in the field based on these trainings, especially when split second decisions have to be made that may result in death. Committee members can better identify inadequacies in training or offer suggestions to it to enhance other aspects of the training. I believe this is vital in the committee's role to serve as a liaison between the police department and the community, as they can better explain how they came to certain determinations and suggestions. For example, if there is a police shooting that unfortunately results in death, I often hear from the public, why couldn't you shoot them in the leg or in the arm? What some of the public does not know is officers are not trained to aim for limbs. Officers go through routine gun training, but there is a chance that bullets can miss while aiming for a limb, resulting in collateral damage, such as other people or property being struck by a bullet. In a situation where deadly force is needed, officers are trained to aim for center mass, the broadest part of the body, which is the torso, to increase the officer's chances of striking a suspect. Even in this description of deadly force, the shooting is meant to maximize the chance of incapacitating a suspect. The intent is not to kill. But as we all know, there are cases where the suspect does die of his injuries, hence the term lethal or deadly force. Another example of public criticism that I hear is, why do they have to shoot him so many times? That's excessive force. This question can be answered simply by putting in a search on YouTube or the internet of suspects being shot and still functioning or performing actions as if nothing ever happened to them. This is another reason why officers do not aim for limbs. Suspects can still have the ability to slash with a knife or shoot back. My second suggestion is smaller in scope, but just as important. Ride alongs with officers of every police district for as long as you serve on the committee. Whether this is a weekly or monthly in the beginning, then tapered off to quarterly, I don't have an idea as to the frequency, but I think it's important to witness what the difference is between training versus real world, real world activity. Again, if suggestions are to be made on training level or out on patrol, I feel committee members will be better informed to weigh in on those issues. I think rotating through every district will help committee members understand that every district has unique characteristics and are dealing with issues that are unique to that district. Some districts are known to have more shootings than others. Some districts may be known for more property crimes than shootings, as an example. 
In closing, I would like to reiterate that I understand why an oversight committee is needed, but I also would like to make sure that such a committee does not turn into a witch hunt. I don't, I don't want to see officers choosing not to act in fear of being prosecuted. I don't want to see officers feeling demoralized due to public opinion based on the misbehavior of a few. I want my community, friends, and family be, to be protected and served, but I would also like my friends and family in law enforcement to go home to their loved ones every night as well. Again, thank you for your time, and this is the end of my testimony. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Please uh, um, stay online uh, as we listen to the third panel member. We will circle back and ask questions and seek comments. Councilman, may I ask who the, what the name of that individual was that just testified? I, I couldn't see his face. Um, and I couldn't, I didn't get his name in the beginning. Who? My, my name is Carlos Rendon. Thank, Thank you. you, Carlos. You're welcome. Ms. Williams, who's the third panelist? Chip Stenton. Good evening, Mr. Stenton. Please you for having your me. testimony. Uh, thank you, Ms. Williams, and thank you to the council members for the privilege of testifying at this committee. Uh, the Citizen Police Oversight Commission has great potential and comes at a time when a, pro a positive presence is very much needed. I echo what I'm sure will be, uh, I'm I echo Jude's call and what I'm sure will be other calls to fully resource uh, this commission out of the police budget. The need for cash commensurate with its importance is clear. That will set a tone from the beginning. But I think clarity in its mandate, filling in what Councilmember Jones calls the blank canvas, is also necessary and is certainly within the control of this council. If the ballot question succeeds, the language around the no CPOC should stress a service aspect and that as an investigative body, it must be adversarial to police. Both with the group violence initiative and PPD's review of its own facial recognition technology and going back in publicly available documentation for at least a decade, the PPD's relationship with the police advisory committee was construed as collaborative, a word used over and over again on both sides. Like with the refusal to subpoena as a citizen, this blew me away. My testimony today is driven by exasperation with that situation, especially as someone who reads through this public output of these interactions, hoping for something otherwise and hoping to take my lead from those who are the paid watchdogs. Simply put, you cannot properly oversee someone that you are hand in hand with. With the inherent power imbalance between a mammoth bloated police infrastructure and an advisory group that at its end was so small, Mayor Kenny appeared to have forgotten about it this summer. That's a recipe for the sort of ineffective efforts that we've seen. PPD and its watchdog must have a relationship, but it cannot be a partnership. In fact, part of the failure in stemming the tide of tragedy in this city has been that exact undue deference to law enforcement. Lacking capacity for real-time review, empowerment to censure and sanction, and the funding needed has meant that even polite suggestions are met with a yes sir or a yes ma'am and no change in behavior. Where the PAC experienced shortcomings, the CPOC presents a fresh start. That is, it must be a tool of oversight rather than partnership from the get-go. Accountability cannot and will not come from advice. Building an adversarial approach into its existence is necessary. Beyond just a change in tone, numerous studies show that adversarial administrative systems are less prone to abuse and more effective in preempting patterns of offense. Change right now doesn't seem like it's on the horizon. It feels like it's being called for in the streets, but in less than 34 hours after their community day was healing, the Philly police were caught on camera throwing full punches at a detained minor. Without Philly youth leveraging social media, that abuse would have been covered up. A properly funded service and oversight focused CPOC could serve as a documentarian of first response as well as an investigator for the sort of police on citizen aggressions that happen too often in this city. With the resources to preserve memory and action investigations, to reach out to harmed communities, and to directly interface with stakeholders, it could bring many of those actions out of the shadow and ensure that they aren't forgotten, building a narrative over time. Because the seat at the table is a start, but a stronger voice and a defined role in helping preserve public memory is critical. A place to point the hurt and the hurting. The only way that its proposed investigatory powers can lead to reparative ends is by setting that tone from the beginning. That's where the language in the ordinances around its formation can prove so important. I urge the council to ensure the CPOC and its inaugural members know that they're mandated to be fully independent and adversarial with a specific mandate to review, monitor, investigate, and act as a clearinghouse to promote public memory and the public interest, building on and 
expanding the successful Denver and Phoenix models. I specifically commend Council Member Garcia and Phoenix for his leadership in this regard, and I think his courage and commitment are a good example if you and your staff members are looking for ways that you can find actionable uh, language to include in what is going to be the ordinances around this. Whatever your opinion on the police, the need for this commission and the need to learn from the glaring errors in judgment showed in its previous iteration comes from a failure to mend relations and to have a body which can stand up to the PPD. Indeed, which views part of its job as to stand up to them and stand alongside citizens. Transparency must be paramount, but sunlight is not enough. We don't need vitamin D. We need consistent change in outcomes for recurring issues because sunshine falls on everyone. But sometimes you want someone standing beside you within the community, not above it, shining a light forward. Only with that break in the past and how the CPOC is planted itself and how all members are told to view their membership of the commission will it be able to grow into the mechanism of accountability that I really and truly believe that it can be. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, um, we are going to ask um, some questions and members of the committee are also going to ask those questions. Um, if you want to be recognized, um, please use the chat feature and Ms. Williams will uh, recognize you in the order in which you appear in the chat feature. Uh, Ms. Farrell, when you were an intern at the advisory committee, how, how many roughly um, cases did you get a chance to see go through the system during that that time? Um, I didn't sit in on them every time, but there were monthly um, use of force reviews um, and we would discuss, I'm trying to remember, it was like maybe 10 to 15 cases per month. And did they come to conclusion? Was they, there, I mean, was we there, always- Was there a determination at the end of these cases un while you were there? I mean, the in the in terms of our audit, we always came to some kind of a conclusion, but it was frequently, there's just not enough information here to really make a determination. Um, so we, we, you know, we did the best we could. So out of those roughly 15 cases a month, what percentage did, where there are no findings and where they dismissed, what percentage? I mean, we, are you talking about the conclusions that the internal affairs came to or that, that, that the PAC came to? That the PAC came to. Um, I mean, in terms of like use of force review, we, I mean, we frequently concluded that under current policy, the use of force was sustained there were also several cases wherein, and the, there, there was use of force, and then there was just audits of routine investigations. Um, they weren't necessarily the same. Um, and I would say probably about half of the cases that we discussed, um, the auditor would just say, they didn't ask this, they didn't ask this, they didn't ask this. Like, I can't determine whether this was justified or not based on this investigation. And so in your opinion, what would have solidified a conclusion? What could have been empowered by the advisory committee to, to help uh, find um, better, better conclusions? Uh, given under the current uh, configuration of the PAC, I don't think there's anything else that we could do. One of the things that we would have liked would have been if the officers who performed investigations at least had the minimum of being trained as detectives so that they knew how to perform investigations, which is something that would be available to them. Um, but what I think needs to happen is the PAC needs to be able to go in and do investigations themselves or the, the new oversight board. Got it. Because um, we had to request anything we wanted. We had to ask them and they could say no. Uh, Mr. Rendon, are you there? Carlos? I am here, I am here sir. I am here. All right. Um, so in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, commissioner, the commission members should go through the training up at the academy 
Well, I just want you to know you eliminated me as ever <laughs> being a uh, member of that commission. I've been up and visited the academy on a number of occasions and could not begin to do the physical or, or, or some of the judgment calls there. Um, but I understand the spirit of what you, you mentioned. Um, how could we get people, commissioners, better in tune with what officers go through every day without having to actually pass the uh, academy? Is there any other way that we could do that? No, I, I, that was a, a little bit of tongue in cheek, uh, council member. I, I don't mean actually going through the, I, I believe it's maybe eight months now, seven months. I, I don't know exactly how long the training is, but you know, and obviously you're not going to go through the running and the jumping and so on and so forth just to be on the committee. But I, my intent was just, just to have a, a better balance of information for council for committee members so that they could just basically make more informed decisions. So but not to just visit the academy, say, you know, things get pointed at and they nod their head and then simply just go home. Um, to get the knowledge that recruits are getting at the academy, uh, to see how they're being trained and how they implement that training in real world scenarios, I think it's vital for the committee to understand that. Well, one of the things that my colleagues are on this um, team's meeting hearing, um, that is very important. We have to create laws and we have to create policies that uh, go all the way back to the training. If we're gonna hold anyone accountable, you mentioned that they're not trained, officers aren't trained to shoot people in the leg. They go, they're trained to use deadly force. And if that is true, we have to really take a look at our training uh, as well. The last person to testify, what, what was their name? I'm, I'm sorry. That escaped me, Ms. Williams. On the first panel, third person. Chip Fenton. Chip. Fenton. Fenton. Mr. Fenton, can Chip. you help me out with your, um, you, you mentioned that the relationship between the, the police department and the oversight commission must be adversarial. I think I know what you mean, but can you elaborate? Absolutely. Um, that one of the things that the fresh start here would allow to happen is to create a commission that sees itself as fully on the side of the citizen that i think and i'm sure all of you experienced uh, especially when things return from being so virtual that working closely with someone can uh, engender good fellow feeling it's uh, the idea that you're on their side and the PAC, at least as of late, has often said, oh, we're partners with uh, the PPD to do better, or we have provided this advice to you in a uh, idea of collaboration to come up with the best solution together. And honestly, my opinion is that what we've seen is that that does not work, that that can be someone's job to work with them collaboratively. Often it will be member city council members' job to represent victims as well as police but if the cpoc is going to be fully empowered to actually make changes and to make a break with some of the shortcomings that we've seen and that have been documented and that were spoken to by even other people on this panel we need to create languaging that says that they are they are not to see themselves as a collaborative member that they are fully independent not just of the machinations of city council but fully independent of pressure from ppd or even ppd in a hand a friendship extending and saying let's work closely together that simply put cannot be their job that can be someone else's job but if that's not the tone from the get-go saying no we're here to be your watchdog because you haven't shown that you can exist without this sort of investigatory body looking over your shoulder, then I think that we, not to use a metaphor that is maybe in poor taste from us before, shoot ourselves in the foot from the get-go, that we need to set it up so that there is a distinct break between the PAC and the CPOC, and that distinct break is that this is not a partnership, this is not a collaboration, this is a new commission formed purely for oversight and purely to advocate for citizens against police aggressions and police abuses. Thank you so much. Um, I want to recognize for the record the uh, presence of member uh, Green. Uh, Derek Green is with us. Ms. Williams, who is in the chat feature Thank to ask? Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, Council Member Thomas has a question first. Member Thomas. Thank you. Uh, to the chairs and to everybody on this committee. Um, thank you to all the people on the panel who testify. Uh, just one question very briefly. Um, in the midst of us thinking about what, how do you become um, a member of the committee, anticipating that the citizens do vote this into law, um, there were a number of different recommendations and suggestions that I heard. Some were good. Uh, one in particular I have a question about. So I've never um, gone through the police academy. I'm not quite sure um, what the police academy and training consist of. I do think it's important that people have an understanding of it, but I'm wondering, um, and it could be anybody on the panel that answered it. I know, I think it was, uh, uh, I believe Carlos, um, Mr. Carlos who asked the question, but I'm wondering um, how realistic is it for people to, to go through that training? I'm thinking about um, would we essentially be discriminating against, you know, possibly uh, a senior citizen maybe, or somebody with disabilities who might be effective but might not be able to go through some of the physical requirements. So I just, I, in the midst of us thinking about the requirements and what we want people to ask for, I just want to assure we're not discriminating against any group of people. So I was hoping that somebody could take a, just a minute or so to maybe answer that and, and help us think through that part of it. Thank you, uh, Member Thomas. Council Member Thomas, uh, I, I can certainly uh, uh, respond to that. Uh, again, uh, just like my response to Council Member Jones, uh, I don't I literally mean going step by step uh, in what a recruit would do um, during the academy. Uh, obviously, you know, there are some people that couldn't handle the physical aspects of the training, um, you know, and, and, and to your point of not being discriminatory against um, folks that may not have the, um, the attributes to, to, to take examinations of that sort, but at least to, to have a good faith effort to understand what is being taught at the academy and what the recruits go through so that when they're done at the academy, how they implement that training in real life scenarios. I, I hope that answers your question yeah. if you have a follow up. Thank you so very much for your response. Ms. Williams, are there any other questions in the chat feature? Co-chair Bradford Gray had a question. Yeah, thank you. I have a, like one question for each of you. Um, for Judith, with respect to your involvement in investigations, what are the types of investigations that you, your, the PAC handled while you were there? And were you able to get the information that you requested in a timely fashion? Um, thank you for your question. I was not deeply involved in these audits. I mostly sat in on them while the analysts uh, performed the audits. And it was just something that struck me um, as they reviewed the cases. They would, it was cases, it could be use of force, it could be just a complaint, it could be, it was a wide range of large to small issues that they were just sampling and looking at them um, to see what kind of investigations the that internal affairs were doing. Um, and it was just a frequent complaint that they just, this investigation was not performed well. I can't make head or tail of what actually happened because I don't have enough to go on because that investigation was poorly done. Um, but I can say that the PAC regularly requests information and it either doesn't come or it is delayed or it is redacted beyond use. Um, the PPD is just not forthcoming with information and that's why I think that the new oversight commission needs to be able to just get it themselves. Thank you. So when you say audits, you were overseeing previous investigations done by police. It wasn't as if you were started, you were given the investigation as the investigative authority. Yes, we were looking at a printout of two or three or four sheets of paper saying, here's what so-and-so said, here's what so-and-so said, um, and there were big holes in the stories. All right, thank you. And Mr. Carlos Rendon, um, I appreciate your testimony and what you said. And yes, nothing should become a witch hunt that would defeat the purpose and become counterproductive. But I do want to ask this because a lot of things that we saw in our office and the work that we've been doing with Power and Lift Free really dealt with everyday encounters on the street between police and citizens, which didn't really require an extreme immersion in police uh, tactics, practices, or policies. It really had to do with human to human contact and understanding right and wrong. I mean, some of them were just that black and white. 
if an officer it was to do something to another person that a person said, you know what, this is not right, uh, they would file a complaint. Um, those things are routine in some of the, the complaint data that we've seen. And so with that, is it your understanding that civilians cannot handle looking at these everyday ordinary encounters to figure out was there something that was not done accurately or could have been done better? Or is there a reason to have real concern for this particular police officer and their behavior? Would that require an immersion in uh, police training to ascertain that? Uh, I believe so. Again, I, I think for members of the committee to have uh, balanced information to get to have that insight from all aspects of trainings through the ride alongs, this basically what a police officer would go through on a daily basis. Um, and not to say to discount the public's reaction or their feelings to whatever it is that they've encountered or witnessed, uh, which is why I think the oversight committee is needed. Uh, again, I just want to make sure that it's not one-sided, uh, is basically my point. Should the person also walk along with someone in the communities that they feel like are over-policed uh, and feel and see how they uh, are, are targeted or treated um, in everyday action? Because what you don't want, you want someone to have a very good balanced understanding, like you said. And there are people that really go through certain things that others will never go through. And so to have that understanding um, from both aspects would be good, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. I, I mean, the more experience that you can gain, the, the better your decisions will be in the long run. So if, if there's both sides to, to the story that they can um, harness, I, I'm all for that as well. And I agree with that 100%. Thank you. And, and last, I'm sorry, I am blank. Uh, Mr. Stanton. Stanton. I, I understand what you mean by adversarial system. I work in a system that's adversarial to another justice partner, which is the district attorney's office. And we are seen, seen to be adversarial in the courtroom. But sometimes when we're in the boardroom, we need to be able to understand the goals. And so adversarial in the sense that I know is fighting to ram my position down someone else's throat. That's what I do in an adversarial area. But when I am goal oriented and principle guided, I cannot let my relationships sacrifice my principles. And I do not. I don't care how much I like the person or how much I like what they say. If it what you do doesn't jive with the principles that I have for my role, that is where we draw the line. Um, is there a way just to have, in the oversight of it that there are principles that whoever will have this position cannot deviate, it should not deviate from. The transparency, and I, I get you say you don't need vitamin D. I like sunshine, but um, I, I thought your analogy was pretty clever. Uh, in any event, I do think that there is, to, to be extremely adversarial, because I see, I saw it in my role as a public defender when I was a trial attorney, I was only interested in, in winning my argument. But when I got to a different role, when I understood that my role was no longer just to ram my argument down someone's throat, but to be true to my principles and use that and kind of getting to what the heart of what we wanted, would that not be enough? And you're saying that we have to write adversarial. I've seen adversarial work counterproductively when it comes to big picture. But I also understand I've seen relationships pretty much delineate principles, which are never a good thing. So uh, where is that kind of middle ground so that we make sure that people aren't adversarial for the sake of being adversarial? Because I know what that looks like, totally. Um, but we also make sure that people aren't sacrificing their principles over relations. And I also know what that looks like. That I hate to the fullest. Um, so what what is it that we can do to make sure that neither one of those obscures what we're trying to, to achieve. Well, I certainly appreciate your experience there, especially coming from having been a public defender. Um, in that situation, if the, inclusive, if the inclusion of setting the tone of adversarialness from the get-go would be a deal breaker, I'm sure that, like you said, from a uh, idea of recruiting people with principle, you could create principles that then would make sure that the CPOC had that sort of relationship, I suppose, without 
uh, sacrificing, like saying that they need to be advocates of citizens all the time. That said, I, I would like to push back slightly, which is to say that I'm sure in those times where you're adversarial and you're pushing really hard, the people that you were pushing for were incredibly thankful for your efforts and that they always came first. I have no doubt. And in that situation, that's where I'm proposing that be the change and the risk that we take here. That perhaps if CPOC is overstepping and we need to in two or four years go back and say they should be nicer with police, that would be a wonderful and new conversation to have, to say that they're holding them a little too accountable, they're being a little too mean. I'd love to try that. I think before then, to, in order to make sure that we have the clean break between a past that didn't meet our expectations and a future that holds an enormous amount of pro promise by being full advocates for citizens, by documenting the aggressions and acts of violence that they go through, I think that it's worth a, a risk. It's worth the chance to say, actually, we're going to say, you fight back hard first. Let's see where that gets us. Not saying that they haven't in the past, but I'm saying that by not working that in specifically into the language, that there is an inertia to aspects of city government, which is good on the local level, that can make people work together, to form unlikely friendships, but that sometimes, and specifically in the case of a citizen oversight of a policing function, might not be what's best for everyone, might just but be what's best for those people in the room. And we're trying to get them to fight for everyone in the city. I, I just want to make sure I, I, I say this. I do understand being accountable to the people, and that doesn't always mean you have to be a direct, extreme adversary the way you're discussing. I, I'm only saying that because okay. I've been both. Um, in this role that I am in, I don't necessarily have to be adversarial unless it, it compromises the principles. Now I have to go at you in a way that people know what my principles are. And even though I'm no longer in a total adversary role, I don't think the community feels that I'm not for them 100%. And so I think it can be achieved. You don't always have to punch to get what you want, but you have to be principled and make people respect what you're trying to do. Aaron. So I, that's, I just want to make sure that we start off on the right foot because you don't want, you know, I, I see people be adversarial for the sake of being adversarial and then they would forget about the person and become competitive between the two adversaries. And that, I think, is, is counterproductive as well. But I do understand what you're trying to say. I, I, I do, and I think there's a way to achieve it. I look forward to seeing what, uh, what comes up around there. I, I definitely take your concerns to heart in that way as well. Although I do want to be firm that while not encouraging, I suppose, to be adversarial for the sake of adversarialness, uh, I think a system that, from an administrative standpoint, is looking to say that this is not a partnership, is not collaborative, it is going to be productive out of its own oversight functions uh, is one that there is immense potential for. And I do look forward to seeing what comes out of these panels and discussions. Thank you. You're on mute, Councilman. Always got to pay attention to that button. Are there any other questions for this panel? I do believe we had individuals with their hands raised. Um, Judith, I believe, had a comment um, from panel one. And then also um, Anthony Arachi from the Police Advisory Commission has his hand raised, if you would like to recognize those individuals. I would like to recognize them in that order. OK, Judith. Thank you. I think it would be fully within the scope of, I agree with Chip's analysis. I think it's excellent. And um, in terms of being adversarial for the sake of being adversarial, yes, of course, that wouldn't be effective. I think it would be um, a great role for this new oversight commission to tell the police department when they've made improvements and when they're doing well. I think they, they don't have to be just telling them when they're doing the wrong thing. Um, thank you. Thank you. Anthony. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment on uh, what Judith and, and Chip said and kind of piggyback off of what Keir said, which was, I mean, it, there's there's adversarial and there's collaborative and it, an oversight, professional and disciplined oversight has to be a blend of the two. Um, we are, I don't, I, I thought it was interesting when we were accused of being collaborative when I, I think that there's probably, if there's any police, any members of the police department listening, they probably all fell off their chairs. Um, 
we we collaborate when it's wise to. Uh, we try to solve problems together because trying to solve problems together is wise. And we're adversarial when we have to uh, as well. I mean, I, I think that the team that we have has done an incredible job, a professional job, and you can check out our, our reports on our website. Um, we don't hold hands with the police. We talk to them like professionals and we advocate for policies that are wise and we've always done so. I think an expansion of oversight is, is, is a wise endeavor. And I, and I think that uh, more authoritative oversight is a wise endeavor. And I think that looking at what we've done with six, really looking at what we've done with six and maybe 10, I think that everyone here in the rest of the city would be amazed at what we've accomplished so far. That's all I have. Thank you so very much for your comment. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this panel? Yes, John Holloway. Mr. Holloway, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, giving me a moment to interject here. I think a word that might help guide the adversarial versus collaborative conversation is the word independent. Um, I think it's essential that the advisory board be uh, independent both in perception and in reality. The concern that I hear Judith articulating is when it's part of the managing director's office and so is the police, there may be a risk of the perception of a lack of independence. Uh, but that independence can incorporate the kind of understanding of the challenges of a police role that Mr. Rendon is talking about. Uh, it can incorporate an understanding that often the police are trying to make changes and there are other structural impediments to those changes. And it can continue to do its role of insisting that those changes be made if the changes aren't happening at a pace that we're comfortable with as a community. So I think it's really important that we ensure, rather than thinking about this as adversarial or collaborative, uh, I would prefer to think of it in terms of, uh, of structural and actual independence and in decision making and recommendations uh, that free up the, the community from worrying about whether inappropriate considerations are reflecting and impacting the, uh, the committee's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Uh, there are no other questions from members of the committee at this time for this panel. Uh, any members of city council seeing, hearing none? I want to thank you for your testimony and it will be uh, considered strongly and they, and I, I, I appreciate that they were slightly or majorly different in some cases, but um, will be all use, used in the painting on that blank canvas. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Ms. Williams, can you read the next panel to testify? Yes. Um, the next panel to testify will be Reverend Tyler, Gail Lack, Marta Gutenberg, and Sherry Cohen. And just for the record, it looks like we are also joined now by Councilman Dom and Council Member Gilmore Richardson. Welcome, members, and thank you for your patience. Uh, in the order in which Ms. Williams called, would you state your name for the record and please begin your testimony? You must take your mic off mute. Can you hear me? Uh, am I loud enough that I'm using yes. a different microphone? Yes, we hear you. All right. Well, uh, Council Councilman, uh, uh, Chairman, and um, uh, your co-chair, uh, our public defender, I want to thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Kelly Tyler, senior pastor of Mother Bethel Amy Church and co-director of Power Live Free, a campaign that works um, around issues of police accountability, ending mass incarceration, and dealing with the epidemic of gun violence in our community. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Councilman, for, uh, Councilman Jones, for your kind words, uh, and you as well, um, uh, Chief Defender uh, Bradford Gray, uh, early in this hearing, but I do want to say on the record that uh, the way in which we organize is really from the ground up. And so uh, while I'm often the spokesperson for Power Live Free, my co-director is Elder Melanie DeBose, who is not on this call today. The co-chair of Power Live Free is Gail Lax, who is and will be testifying. And we have an amazing team of clergy and lay people who work together and uh, are really working as a group effort. Um, too many persons 
to name on this call. So we certainly appreciate uh, what you have said about us. Um, I want to say that I'm not going to be able to stay on um, now because uh, it's been brought to my attention by my 16 year old who walked in uh, about a half an hour ago to inform me that a young black man was shot and killed in West Philadelphia on 61st and Locust, just as this meeting was starting uh, by two white officers. I've seen the video on Instagram and it's um, truly horrifying. Uh, a man had a knife and I cannot uh, stop counting after 10 shots. Um, so I'm going down to the scene and uh, trying to organize some clergy to be there as well. The persons from Power Live Free will uh, remain on and be uh, in a, uh, will testify and will also be able to answer uh, any questions that you might have. But, um, you know, it's, um, it's moments like this that really, I think, remind us the importance of the work of police oversight. And as I sat there and watched two persons who had, you know, a good amount of time to find a way to disarm this man or to use some non-lethal way and to think that the only response was to shoot and kill him in the street. Um, I, 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 you know, again, I'm, I'm really just at a loss right now, um, councilmen and, and members of public safety. And so everything that I wanted to say is, um, will certainly be covered by uh, Gail Lax, Marta Guttenberg, and Sherry Cohen, who are representing us today. Uh, they'll cover all of the points, but uh, if you'll excuse me, uh, I'm gonna head down there and I certainly hope to see uh, Council Member Guntier there. I've been in contact with her as well uh, when this hearing is over. So thank you for uh, your being a part of all of our town halls over the last 16 weeks as well, and for uh, the support of public safety and city council, your commitment to this. And I know that this won't be the last time we're talking about this. So please, um, I, I appreciate your understanding. Thank you. The, Reverend work, con the work continues. The work it's continues. Unfortunate, very. Okay. Who, who do we have next, Mrs. Williams? Gail Lack. Gail Lack. Hi, uh, thank you, Councilman and Co-Chair Jones and Co-Chair Keir Bradford Gray uh, and members of the Public Safety Committee. As the mission of the Philadelphia Police Department is to protect and serve all the citizens of Philadelphia, Live Free is advocating for a strong elected oversight board made up of members of the community and independent of the mayor's office and separate from the police department. Police should not be policing themselves. We want the Citizens Police Oversight Commission to ensure that the actions of the police department as a whole and that of in individual police officers, no matter where along the chain of command, are transparent and that the police department as a whole and individual officers are accountable for their actions. We want the Citizens Police Oversight Commission to have full investigative power this unit would receive, investigate, and resolve all citizens' complaints of police misconduct. For example, but not limited to, these would be complaints for verbal abuse, abuse of authority, civil rights abuses, lack of service, and use of force. The invest investigative unit, to do its job well, would need to have one investigator for every 70 to 100 police officers. For a police force of 6,500 officers, that would be 65 investigators. To do its job well, the investigative unit would need direct access to all police department records, videos, body camera footage, and the ability to interview police department personnel, as well as subpoena power. Direct access is needed for timely investigation and resolution of complaints. There also needs to be a designated person at the police department to take responsibility for any non-compliance with access to information, as well as penalties to the department for non-compliance. The investigative process needs to be transparent. 
Each individual person who makes a complaint needs to know the timeline, status, and resolution of their complaint. The Oversight Commission should also provide the public information via an accessible database and written reports of information about the number of complaints, types of complaints, and any patterns that may reveal patterns of individual officer misconduct, as well as departmental patterns of systemic injustice. I'd like to talk about recent research presented in Live Free's last town hall by Susan Hudson, who is the Director of Police Oversight in New Orleans. And she is also president of NICOL, which stands for the National Association of Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. This research was published this fall, 2020, by Usman Ali and Sean Nicholson Crotty from Indiana University School of Public Affairs. They analyzed 217 cities between 1981 and 2015. They determined that strong citizen oversight agencies with the power to investigate and sanction police compared to those agencies that just review police behavior showed a decrease in the violent crime rate, lessened the number of officer involved shootings, lessened racial profiling, and reduce the number of police officers killed in the line of duty. So a strong citizen oversight agency showed a decrease in the violent crime rate, lessened the number of officer involved shootings, lessened racial profiling, and reduced the number of police officers killed in the line of duty. To close, it is extremely important that the power and authority of this new Citizens Police Oversight Commission be clearly defined so we can move forward with community-led citizen oversight of policing that will lead to real change for the citizens of Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Who's, who's Sherry next? Cohen. Ms. Cohen, how are you? How are you? Get your mute button. Check your mute button. All right, sorry about that. How's that? Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Councilman Jones, for all of your work on this issue, convening this hearing today. And uh, thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Chief Defender Bradford Gray, for all that you do and for your work on this issue as well. And uh, it's a pleasure to see all the other council people or uh, hear them on this uh, Microsoft Teams uh, broadcast today. First, I just want to say um, um, it, I'm just blown away from what uh, Reverend Dr. Tyler just said. I mean, you know, here we're convening this, you all are convening this hearing and we're speaking at it. And at the same time, you know, we have, um, you know, a police killing on the streets. So it's just, you know, a, a very, you know, a very upsetting moment right now. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, I guess I'll just emphasize or, or just restate a point that I know um, Dr. Tyler was going to talk more about, uh, which is the need for an elected, um, the need for an elected oversight commission. And we just wanted to convey to everyone on this call that um, there, there is precedent for this. Uh, Detroit 
uh, for example, um, has an oversight body that's in part elected and part appointed. And there's a number of other cities where community groups and coalitions are coming together for, um, you know, for, for a, an elected body. And that's in Chicago. There's an ordinance called uh, the Police Accountability Council, Chicago Police Accountability Council Ordinance. And in New York as well, there are people mobilizing for that. So uh, we just wanted to make sure that, that, that you knew that. Um, so I'm going to speak about um, just some general points and more specific about uh, the expansive possibilities of this commission. Uh, um, we believe that community oversight is only meaningful when, as we've been discussing already, uh, when the commission is um, independent, uh, actually represents uh, impacted communities, is adequately funded, which we know that uh, was not, not uh, the case um, here in Philly to date. And as Gail was stating, has full investig investig investigatory powers. And we would also like it to have full disciplinary power. Now, of course, we're aware of issues regarding the uh, police contract. Um, and we're aware of binding arbitration uh, through Act 111. And these are going to be um, continued focuses of our attention. But uh, we do want to state that we do see that as within the, um, the within the necessary power of this entity in order to make the oversight meaningful. So we would like to see this uh, wonderful agency that you all are setting up set the policy for the police department, set the budget for the police department hire and fire, be able to fire the police chief, and uh, as I mentioned, have the power to discipline police officers uh, in the future. I'd like to give an overview of the broad powers of two other police commissions that we've been looking at. And also, um, I know Dr. Tyler was gonna mention for everyone listening today who did not get a chance to um, watch the town halls. There were eight town halls that uh, Power Live Free um, had over the course of the summer and into the fall. They're all on the Power Facebook page. And um, there were other council people uh, who came and spoke from their cities, as well as advocates and activists and professionals in the field of civilian oversight. And it was just an incredible learning opportunity. We want to thank everyone who is here today who participated in some or uh, in some cases in most of those calls. But it's just a wealth of information that I think can help guide this work going forward. Um, and that reminds me of another point, which is that um, we are grateful for the opportunity to come before you today, but also we are hoping that there will be a continued inclusive process going forward so that this is as much a ground up um, endeavor as possible and that the people of the city will feel that this is their oversight commission. So we look forward to future opportunities um, where there will where, um, you know, which will be inclusive of the public to help shape uh, the form of this, of this, uh, you know, this oversight commission. So um, we had speakers at one of our town halls uh, from uh, San Francisco who spoke about the police commission there and all the things they're able to do. And then we've also had a, reach, a research group who have been researching additional um, uh, cities around the country that have um, that do oversight to see what we can learn from them as well. So I wanted to just give a mention to 
a couple of these um, entities today. San Francisco, um, you know, has a police commission and they also have another entity called the Department of Police Accountability. So I think these are interesting structures that uh, might be very helpful to us here in Philly to have um, separate entities that do different aspects of this wide ranging work of um, public safety and uh, police accountability. So in San Francisco, for example, the commission sets policy for the police department. They're also able to conduct disciplinary hearings on charges of police misconduct filed by the chief of police or the other entity, the Department of Police Accountability. The police commission determines all disciplinary action beyond 10 day suspensions and is also the appellate body for all officer appeals from discipline imposed by the chief of police. The commission appoints and regulates patrol special officers and may suspend or dismiss patrol special officers after a hearing on charges filed. This is one example of a policy passed by the San Francisco Police Commission this summer. They uh, drafted an anti-bias policy which mandates that officers identify themselves by name and rank, state the reason the officer has stopped them before the officer asks for a person's driver's license and registration. In these instances, the officer must also provide in written form the officer's name, rank, star number, and information on how to file a complaint or commendation. So I wanted to share that um, policy. I thought it was very exciting. Um, it's right now still a draft policy from San Francisco because the policy must still be reviewed and haggled over by the San, Fran San Francisco Police Officers Association. To uh, briefly mention Oakland as well because they also have uh, two entities, um, a Civilian Police Commission and a separate co community police review agency. So the Civilian Police Commission has the ability to write policing policy, discipline officers, and they also have the right if they choose to fire the police chief. Um, the Community Police Review Agency investigates complaints involving use of force, in custody deaths, profiling and public assemblies. The Police Commission can also direct the review agency to look into other possible incidents of police misconduct. So I do want you to know that this year, 2020, the Police Commission of Oakland, maybe you heard about it, did uh, terminate the, the chief of police. So um, notes for a moment. I wanted also to mention that um, at this time, which is a, of course a movement moment where uh, greater, you know, more transformative policies may be possible now uh, when they may not be possible at another time. I wanted to mention that Portland, the same day that we're all voting, if we haven't done so already uh, next week, um, and we have this ballot measure on, Portland um, has an oversight measure on where they have placed into the ballot measure um, that, they, that the budget for their oversight entity will be 5% of the uh, police department's budget. So I wanted to make sure folks know that. And you may know that unfortunately our um, ill-funded ill uh, PAC, which has been doing great work, um, but nevertheless uh, has been very poorly funded, um, has just had, I mean, their percentage of their funding in relation to the funding of the police department is less than 0.1%. It's actually to 0.075. So it's it's difficult to see how, you know, such a small group 
can provide effective oversight for, for 600, for 60, uh, 6,500 officers. Um, and others have said that, well, the Oversight Commission budget could match the internal affairs budget in Philadelphia. And that budget, I understand, is 23 million. So um, I think with that, I'm going to close for now. Again, uh, thank you all and uh, look forward to this work together. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Cohen. Um, the irony is not lost. This call is being recorded for quality assurance. Modesto? I think he might be trying to connect our last witness. Oh. Well, in, while we do that, the irony is not lost on me that while this special committee on ju uh, criminal justice reform is having this most important hearing to talk about the establishment of a citizen's police oversight commission, that a young man in Southwest Philadelphia uh, was shot uh, to death. Um, and the circumstances, we, we, we don't have a lot of detail on, uh, but um, it just emphasizes the importance of that there being a, a entity um, that can review um, fairly these type of police interactions with the citizens of Philadelphia so that the public can feel that there is redress, that the public can have confidence that, that, that it's not a them against us scenario and that justice will be served. And um, this commission, it should be established to protect uh, citizens, but also protect police officers if they are not in uh, the wrong. And, and that balance it is very important. So my heart is heavy right now. My heart is heavy right now. Um, but my resolve to uh, see this commission move forward has just been intensified. So. To totally, totally. Ms. Williams, do we have a, uh, the last witness? Uh, Modesto, were you able to connect Marshall? This call is being recorded for quality assurance. This is Chelsea. What can I do for you? So, um, are there any comments from members of the committee? Uh, and if so, please feel free um, to, to cite them now. Oh, I believe um, Co Chair Gray has her hand raised. My apologies. Co Chair so, Gray? I've been working with you guys for a long, for a while on this. And I know how much work and research you've done looking at other models across the country of what this should look like, the type of independence it should have, the type of authority it should have. And I just would want to say that I am really happy that you guys will be here to continue to help us shape the perfect fit for our city because while other cities have their versions, um, their models, and we can, we have, I've learned so much through these hearings from all of them, I am really, really looking forward to taking what works from everyone else and making it Philadelphia's own. So thank you for all of your efforts. And I just want to say this, I did unfortunately get a video of what happened um, at the shooting. Um, disturbingly, I opened it and it was very graphic. It was very disturbing. And I do hope that someone is able to evaluate 
what happened here and what could have been done different. A young man's life is lost, never to come back. And I do think there has to be something for an intermediate ground. Um, ordinarily, I say something like, Judge Leon, I'm coming to your house to have a drink afterwards, but I would not do that because it is really heavy. Um, but I will, I will say this, this is necessary. Our work continues. Our work continues. Ms. Williams, are there any others to testify on this resolution? Uh, no, there are no other witnesses, but Judge DeLeon did have his hand raised. Um, Judge Who DeLeon? recognizes Judge DeLeon? Your Honor, are you there? Yes. I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say that we should trust the science. You know, we've heard some great testimony as to what's taking place in other uh, cities and jurisdictions and, um, and reports from various uh, social scientists. And just like as far as medical science, we should trust these social scientists also. And what they're saying uh, is the correct way to go. Council Member Green. You're on mute, Council Member. Thank, thank you, Ms. Williams. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, for having this uh, continuation of special community and criminal justice reform, um, as well as you know, having members of the Public Safety Committee participate. Uh, I did get a chance to listen to a number of witnesses this afternoon, early evening, as well as had opportunity to listen and participate in the Power Live Free um, uh, twice a month um, calls um, with various um, members of legislative bodies from around the country, really provide a lot of content that I know you and your office were very involved in those meetings as well. So I think it gives us a, a good roadmap of information and how we move forward in reference to next steps. Uh, I'm hopeful that the voters of this city um, a week from tomorrow uh, will support this initiative as well as the other criminal justice reform initiatives that we are doing in this legislative body and give us the ability to uh, move forward with this entity in a way that addresses um, some of the issues we've been talking about um, over the past number of months uh, and also more recently with the video that so many of us just saw on um, this evening. So I thank you, uh, Mr. Chair um, and uh, your co-chair, um, Kier Bradford Gray uh, and other members of the special committee as well as the Council Committee on Public Safety. Look forward to our continued work on this issue and bring about a police advisory entity that lives up to um, what we need it to do. And one final point I will say is that some people may have forgotten that this type of advisory organization actually had its start here in the city of Philadelphia, um, going back uh, so many years ago with the um, Richardson and Clark administrations. So I'm looking forward for us getting back to that leadership that we as a city have done in reference to police oversight um, through the work of this legislative body and also through the work of the special committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Green, for your insights and continued support in this effort. It is truly appreciated. Ms. Williams, are there any others to testify on this resolution? No. So I want to thank all of the panelists, all of the members of the committee, for participating today. And um, this will conclude uh, the uh, special committee hearing uh, on criminal justice reform for the business for today. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Judge. Thank you. Okay, take care. All right.